Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Faith Online today. Uh, we're really glad that you're here and really glad to be able to connect with you. My name's Tim. If we haven't met before, uh, oftentimes I'm helping uh, the musicians prepare uh, to lead us in worship. Uh, and I also do some small group work here. And from time to time, I get the chance to speak. And so that's my role today. Uh, it's also my pleasure just to welcome you and to pray for us as we get going. So why don't we bow our heads and then the worship team uh, will play some songs for us. And you can worship with your friends or your family or your small group, uh, whoever you're with this morning. We're just really glad that you're here. God, thank you so much for bringing us uh, to another place where we can gather and be uh, together in spirit with your people. Uh, guide and direct us, uh, speak to our hearts um, through songs and your scripture. Uh, God, uh, make this a, a special moment where you come and you rest in our homes and you rest on our hearts uh, and you do the work that you want to do in our lives. Uh, God, get us ready for what you have for us in the coming week. And uh, we just want to pray a blessing uh, on all these people as we worship and pray together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not all my failures I tried to hide It was my truth Till I met you You called my name
I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing Better than you, oh, there's nothing, nothing that's better than you. And I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley And there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Cause there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing, nothing that's better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies Turn seas into highways You're the only one who can Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing that's better than you Culture is a bit of a funny thing, isn't it? I mean, 
it's, it's kind of hard to define. If you look up culture in the Webster's Dictionary, it'll say things about practices that a group of people have decided they're going to share together. But that doesn't really encapsulate the spirit of culture. Um, culture is better experienced than it is explained. Uh, let, let me give you an example. Um, you'll know that you have broken culture at various points in your life. And I've seen it a few times during this whole COVID-19 thing. Uh, let's go back to uh, March. And in March, if you went to the store, assuming you were allowed to go to the store, right? This is after the first couple of weeks. But if you were one of the first people who went to the store with a mask on, people looked at you like you were from an alien country or another planet. And yet, now here we are a few months down the road, and today, as I'm recording this, is the first day that our region of the world has decided to go out in public, you have to wear a mask. And I've noticed this. Sometimes I'm a little bit forgetful. And so if I get out of my car and go into the store, Melissa is always good at remembering to take a mask with her when we go to the grocery store. But I don't always remember. And sometimes I get into the store and Melissa will start to put her mask on and I will have forgotten to bring mine. And when that happens, you know that you've broken cultural rules because people look at you the same way that they used to look at people who wore masks in a store. Isn't that a funny thing? Culture is, a, is an interesting thing, and yet it holds such a powerful sway over our lives and helps us to make decisions. These days, I am going to need to remember to bring my mask because for sure, not only will the police give me a hard time if I don't wear my mask, but everybody else is going to be even that much more heightened to it. And culture is going to play a bit of a part in the story that we're looking at today. If you've been with us for the last number of weeks, you know that we started a series in the book of Luke. And we're just moving our way piece by piece through the book over the next number of weeks and months. And today we're nearing the end of chapter 1, talking about the birth of John the Baptist. And so there are two things I want to do today as I speak. Uh, the first is that I want to try and explain the historical significance of John. Um, that if we don't know certain things about John, we're going to miss certain parts of the story that are coming up. And the second thing that I want to do is, well, so what? You know, I always think when we look at the scriptures, we should ask ourselves, how is that going to affect my life today? What is it saying to me right where I am? Because this isn't just stories about 2,000 years ago. This is the life-transforming word of God given to us over time and through the ages. And so we want to know what it's saying to us now. So let me just start at verse 57 here. I'm going to read. I'll maybe make a comment or two as we go through. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll finish uh, for now at verse 67. So verse 57, the birth of John the Baptist, it says this, Luke chapter 1. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. Remember, Elizabeth hadn't been able to have children up to this point. She's very advanced in years, and so this is a massive moment in her life, and everybody is celebrating with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. So remember, Zechariah was told in advance about John's birth, he had some doubts, um, unlike Mary, who said, let it be as you have said. Zechariah was like, whoa, whoa, whoa hang on. Uh, I'm not sure God can do that. And in response, God said, well, okay, through his angel, Gabriel. Uh, Zechariah, just take some time out and think about it. And so Zechariah became uh, mute. And as we're going to see here in a second, actually maybe uh, deaf as well. Because it says, after after uh, Elizabeth had said, no, he is to be called John, of course, this was breaking with their culture. They said to her, there is no one amongst your relatives with that name. So then they made signs to his father. That's where we pick up that little piece that maybe it was more than just mute. Maybe it was also deaf because they had to make signs to talk to him, not for him to talk to them, to find out what he would like to name the child. And he asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, because this was so countercultural. He wrote, his name is John. 
And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all of these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. People knew God was up to something in this story. There was too much that had happened that was somewhat miraculous already for people to not take notice. And we learn through Zechariah's prophecy, what is called Zechariah's song, exactly what it is that we're supposed to know about John. The people were wondering, and we have the opportunity to look back. And so verse 67 says, His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. I know that's a big chunk of scripture, but let me tell you the highlights in there, the things that I think about John that we are supposed to know. And the first is that John's coming is the very beginning of God's end game for salvation, right? Zechariah says he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant that he swore to our father Abraham. See, God has been telling people all the way along, I have a plan for how this is supposed to go. And people all the way along to lesser degree mostly, but sometimes a greater degree, believe and trust in God's plan. But it's taken some time for it to get fleshed out because the people just don't do the things that God has asked them to do. They had their own ideas, and God in his long-suffering mercy and love for us is willing to try to work with us where we're at. But Jesus has always been the end game. And see, Zechariah knows that John's coming heralds the coming of God to his people. Now, I'm not sure that Zechariah knew that God meant Jesus. We see him use the word Lord in retrospect, and we understand that he was talking about Jesus. Zechariah was a first century Jewish man. When he said Lord, he meant God. When he said that he was coming uh, to save us from the hand of our enemies, he was probably making the same kind of uh, mistake that people were making all the way along with Jesus, that somehow he was going to be the one who rescued them from occupation. You know, the Jewish people have been enslaved by somebody for a great portion of their own history. Whether it was the Egyptians or the Babylonians or now the Romans in Zechariah's day, they're an oppressed people waiting for somebody to rescue them, waiting for a king to come that would bring salvation to their people. We know that when Zechariah uses the term horn of salvation and the promise that was made to Abraham to make his family into a blessing to all the nations, that there would be a seed that would arise from his family line that would, that would bless everyone. We know that it was Jesus that he's talking about. And John's coming is the beginning of the end game. It's the beginning of of heralding that Jesus is on the horizon. He is coming. He is going to be the sun that rises from heaven to set his people free. Now, I want to pause for a quick second and ask you something. Have you ever longed for something deeply? Have you ever been impatiently waiting 
for something to happen. I have to admit that over the last six months, I have been impatiently waiting for professional sports to start again. And I apologize if you're not a sporty person. I'm going to take a little piece here, and hopefully you can find something in your life that, that, that this reminds you of. But six months ago, when COVID-19 hit, all of the professional sports sit down. And see, sports are kind of a, a part of my daily routine. Usually when I wake up, I don't wake up well. I'm not, I'm not a good morning person. And so when I wake up, I grab a cup of coffee, I sit down on my couch, and I turn on TSN, and I watch highlights from the night before. And it's uncanny how different the morning feels without that regular dose of professional sport. For a while, I tried to keep interested in how COVID was affecting all these people through sports, but, you know, it's just not the same thing as watching goals being scored and, and, and home runs being hit and, you know, all the things that you sort of come to enjoy through watching sports highlights. And if you're a fan, you, like me, are just on the edge of your seat today. Today is the day that the NBA starts their season again. Saturday, today is a Thursday, Saturday, in two days, the NHL comes back and we can watch hockey on television again. I sat down a couple of nights ago because there was a, a warm-up game between the Montreal Canadiens and the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I sat down to watch it and my daughter, Layla, she said, Daddy, can I watch with you? And in that moment, with nachos on my lap and my daughter by my side, we were Canadian. Again. Now I know, it's really not that important. But what I'm trying to say here is that if we can miss something as superfluous as professional sport, as much as I seem to have missed it, as eager as I am for it to come back, what was it like for the people of Israel to have not heard from God for 400 years. Because when Zechariah says, you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, this was a very special thing. Because, see, in the past, God had used prophets to send his message to his people, to try to bring them back to him, to try to get them to live the life that he knew they would be most fulfilled living. And the people had ignored and worse, prophets for so long that God went dark through the prophets. He just said, this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it this way anymore. I'm going to shut down the lines of communication until my end game starts. And so there have been no prophets to bring the word of God in 400 years plus at this point. When Zechariah says that the coming Lord is going to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. I can't help but wonder whether he wasn't talking about the religious system that had been built up in the, in the absence of God's voice. See, people are very good at building religions. People are very good at making rules. People make all kinds of rules to follow God that actually aren't from Scripture. But most of the time what that is, is it's the absence of God's voice in their life. And I wonder if you can just put yourself in a place where maybe God felt very distant from you. Maybe God seemed very far away. And you hadn't heard from God in weeks or months or maybe even years. Hope seemed to be very far away and fear was very close. How must it have been for those people? And now, for Zechariah to be saying, no, 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 God is speaking again. My son, this baby, is going to be the first prophet we've had in hundreds and hundreds of years. And even more importantly, he is going on before the Lord who is coming to prepare a way for him so that people will know how to be saved through the forgiveness of their sins. Because God is merciful. John sits, here's the third thing that I think we need to know. So the first thing we need to know is that 
John heralds the very beginning of the end game of God's salvation plan. The second thing we need to know is he's the first prophet in hundreds of years. And the third thing is that John sits at the very apex of the turning from the Old Testament to the New Testament. John's importance to the story going forward cannot be underestimated. And if we don't understand who John is, then we will miss pieces of the story that are important for us as we look to be transformed by the power of these words, by the power of the living God who speaks through these words. And I also want to look at this idea that that Zechariah ends with. And here's how I think this gets really practical. We're going to go back to, to, to culture and, uh, and, and look at this last part of the, of the passage. Because it says, so John is heralding the coming of, of the Lord Jesus. Give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet to peace. And then interestingly, it ends with, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. So our story kind of starts with like this, this breaking of culture by John and Elizabeth, or sorry, Zechariah and Elizabeth to name John, something that their family was not supposed to name anyone. And then we hear about John, who is going to go into the wilderness and do all kinds of countercultural things which incidentally I think probably have something to do with what Gabriel said John's life must be like where he shouldn't take wine and, 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 and he had these, these things that he wasn't going to do in his life to prepare his, himself for ministry, specific things that were given to John specifically. And so John was going to live a countercultural life and so he went and lived in a countercultural way until his ministry time was ready. But this passage ends with this this beautiful picture of hope, the sun rising and people being forgiven and, and those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, that God's coming would guide our feet into the path of peace. And this is the connection that I want to make. I wonder sometimes whether we don't misunderstand the kinds of things that God might be asking us to do and the reason he might be asking us to do them. Because this idea of culture and maybe even being countercultural is something that if you hang around the church long enough, somebody will bring up. But I think often it's, it's misinterpreted. Uh, you know, it's, it goes back to that idea of like building religions for ourselves. And so in the, it, it, wanting to be closer to God, we, we make more rules and we put people under more oppression uh, don't use zippers. Those are bad. Um, you know, when I was growing up, the ultimate way that you could tell if somebody was a Christian is if you don't smoke and you don't drink and you don't go to dances and you didn't go to the movies. Um, and you know what? To be fair, I don't think you should smoke anyway. But it's not because God won't love you if you smoke. Right? Uh, I, I don't think you can make some bad choices about the movies that you watch. But I don't think God loves you any less because you were watching the movies. I always thought it was interesting when I was a kid that we could watch things on our television when they came out on VHS, but we couldn't go to the movie theater and watch because somehow that was different. See, there's these rules, these things that aren't in the scripture. and, And I understand some of those things came from okay places. We were concerned about what might influence our hearts and our minds. But to be honest, the rules became so important that that's how we knew if somebody was a good Christian. And I don't think that's how God asked us to be countercultural. Here's how I think God asked us to be countercultural. I think the story shows us the, 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 what Zechariah experienced in becoming mute and then being released. Is that the problem was Zechariah was putting his faith and hope in what he knew, what he had seen. He didn't put his hope in God. He didn't put his hope in the messenger that God sent, in the message that God sent to Zechariah. And I wonder what it would be like if we were to put our hope completely in God. And I wonder what it is in our life that replaces the hope that God wants to bring into our life. And here's how I think we can be countercultural. So let me, let me talk about some things that maybe uh, we might put our hope in. Uh, perhaps we put our hope in our good health. 
which we have no control over, as COVID has so poignantly uh, shown us. Maybe we put our hope in our spouse. Maybe we put our hope in the car that we drive. Often we put our hope in a, in a brand that's been marketed to us. Often we put our hope in something that we have brought in as our identity. I'm a musician. I'm a doctor. I'm a teacher. And we find our hope and fulfillment in those things. And what this passage is asking for us to do counterculturally is to radically hope in Jesus. He is the horn of salvation. He is the rising sun. If you are living in darkness, only he can peel back the darkness with the light of his light and love and mercy. Only he can forgive us of our sins and bring mercy into our lives. The countercultural thing that we should be taking from this passage is to be people who are willing to do whatever God asks us to do and put our hope in him not in anything else, to put him at the very highest place. See, John was coming to tell us the king is here. Things are changing. Hope is stirring. And for us today, we still have the same call to put all of our hope. So many of us are hoping for God to work in our lives. One of the things that I think we see from Zechariah is this thing that comes up in scripture, but maybe we don't want to talk about all the time, is that God seems to link his movement in our lives to our willingness to do what he asks. And it's funny, isn't it, that we want God to do things in our life, but we don't want to be the person he's asked us to be. We don't want to do the things he's asked us to do. Please don't get me wrong. I am not saying that your salvation is dependent on the things that you do for God. That is not what I'm saying. I am saying that God has an opinion about how our life should be lived. And if we expect God's best for our life, then we should be doing all that we can to live our best life for God. There is this reciprocal nature. The scriptures are very, very clear about it. And I think in Zechariah's story, we see that he doesn't hope in God. And God says, Zechariah, you need to change your perspective. And he does something pretty radical, which fortunately he hasn't done to me when I doubt him. But when Zechariah accepts by faith that God is working in the life of his son, it doesn't matter what Zechariah's friends and family thought his son should be named. He knew that his son should be named whatever God asked, whatever he did, because Zechariah had come to the place where he knew all of our hope, mine, yours, our cultures, is in what God is doing and what he's heralding in this little baby that he's gifted my wife and I with. Let me pray for us because I think we all can take a moment to go, God, what is it that you're trying to do in my life? How are you trying to bring hope into my life? And what are you asking of me today that would unleash the mercy that you want to have for my life? Let's pray together. Jesus Christ, all of our hope is in you. Everything that we long for, everything that we can hope for, our souls can only find fulfillment in you. And so today, God, I I pray that you would give me, our church, anyone else who's watching, the, the courage to do what you ask us to do. Give us the wisdom to not make up rules that aren't helpful to try and replace your work in our life. God, if we are desperate for you to work in our lives, help us to hit our knees and pray. To talk to our Father, the one who is so rich in mercy. To shine the light of his Son, Jesus, his forgiveness, his mercy into our lives to peel back the darkness and bring us hope. We ask humbly in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
So let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song, cause you are good, you're good. Oh, you are good, you're good. Oh, cause you are Thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, we hope that this has been a time of blessing for you, that you've heard from the Lord, that you feel encouraged, uh, and that you have known that you are loved, prayed for, and supported uh, by your church family. If there's anything that you need, please reach out to us. Uh, we are available 
uh, in various ways through social media and email and uh, eager to help where and when we need to. So be blessed and have a great week. See you next Sunday.